Welcome. I'm going to start here by reading Matthew chapter 3. And um, let's get right into this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the baptizer came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, I'm just going to stop there for a second. Now, um, I know some of the uh, Bible translation says John the Baptist, okay? John the, bapti- John the Baptizer came. Now, the original Hebrew name of John is Yochanan or Yahuchanan. Um, so I'm going to be using those names interchangeably, okay? Now, John, if we were to go in a time machine and go back, you know, 2,000 years to the time of, uh, of John, and we called him John, he probably wouldn't even respond because he doesn't know that, you know, he, nobody calls him John per se, uh, although we call him John today. Um, back then it was Yohanan or Yehuchanan. So in those days, John the Baptist came, okay, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, here again, we see that the first message that a very, very important figure um, in the Bible, uh, pre- the very first message is repent. The very first word is repent. We see that throughout the scripture, throughout all the way through from Genesis, all the way through to the so-called New Testament, we see the um, the whole message of repentance, even though we might not hear that word repent, the actual word repent, we see the the meaning of repent, you know, turn from your wicked ways. You know, the, the word repent here uh, in the Greek means to change your mind, of, of course, changing your mind in regards to sin and in regards to living uh, your way and start living God's way, you know, changing your, your mind in, re, in regards to loving sin or liking sin or choosing sin and changing your mind to 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 not choose sin anymore. Um, The word repent in the original Hebrew means to return, to return to God. So it's like doing a 180 degree turn going back to God. Um, So yes, the primary message of the scriptures here is repentance. Now, don't forget that John uh, is what Jesus called John the most, uh, basically the most, uh, uh, not the most important, but one of the greatest men that's ever been born. Um, so this is a very important thing, and we uh, this is quite a privilege that we have uh, to actually read the words that John actually preached, one of the greatest human beings that has ever been born. Okay, so he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now let me do a two-step, um, let me do a two-step translation or summary of what this actually means because a lot of people don't really know what the phrase kingdom of heaven is at hand means we see it over and over again throughout the so-called new testament Um, so the kingdom of heaven first of all kingdom of heaven or kingdom in itself is talking about letting God rule in your life, letting God be king, okay? Let, so that you yourself, it, you don't rule your life. God rules your life. God calls the shots. God makes the rules, okay? And yes, we do live by rules. We can't let God rule our life without rules. And I know some of peop- some people think that we don't have any laws to go by anymore. We just go by faith. We just go by grace. Well, listen, you got to take it all in context. You got to take it all in context. The kingdom of heaven, any kingdom, has rules, has has uh, laws to go by, okay? And a lot of these people that preach that uh, we don't have any rules or any laws, they make their own laws. Well, you got to say the sinner's prayer in order to be saved. Well, you got to believe or you got to confess Jesus is Lord to be saved. Or you got to respond to an altar call or something like that. I mean... One thing after another. Oh, it's not by works that we're saved. It's only by faith. No man's works is, is, is involved here so that no one can boast. Well, first of all, you have to, as Paul said, you have to hear the gospel, which is actually through a man's work of preaching. So in other words, you're telling me it's not by works, but you are saying that it is by works, by someone else's work, because they have to preach. They have to print the Bible. They have to relay the scriptures to you. That's a work. They have to preach. 
uh, somehow written form or verbally preach to you in order for you to understand uh, and, uh, you know, to accept the, uh, the word of God and, and to be saved. So, yes, we have to uh, let God rule. There are rules. There are, there are laws. The kingdom of heaven, the rule of heaven is at hand, okay? It's right within your grasp. It's not hard to get. It's not like you have to climb the highest mountain or you have to go down in the Mariana Trench or something like that to get it, okay? Or, or not dig, dig all the way down to China. I don't know. You don't have to do something extraordinary. All you have to do is just, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, which means it is within grasp. It's, let me put it this way. The first step of translation, translating this kingdom of heaven is at hand, I would say, is to say that it, that it is it is within your reach, okay? It means it's within your reach, it's right there, it's, it's at, you know, within your grasp, okay? Now, to simplify it even more, to simplify this even more, you can say the kingdom of heaven uh, is easy to attain, or it's easy to come under the rule of the reign of God. It's easy to come under, uh, to let God's law be the law in your life, okay? And I mean, a lot of people are hypocrites. They let man's law be the rule of their life and they say no to God's law, okay? We gotta, we've got to go back to the Bible. We've got to go back to the scriptures. We've got to go back to first century Christianity, when the Lord walked and talked on the earth and shortly thereafter, the, you know, in the book of Acts, we, go to, we got to go back to this kind of faith. We got to go upstream. We've got to bypass all of the pollution. We've got to go upstream and take the, you know, the pure gospel. If you want to be a Christian, if you really want to be a, a believer in God, if you really want to be a, 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 you know, a believer in the Holy Scriptures, you might as well just go for the whole thing. If you want to go for a swim, don't go into a wading pool, okay? Go into a real pool, okay? So, yes, the kingdom of heaven, the rule of God, following his laws is easy. That's basically what that means, okay? Some of you might say, oh, no, it's impossible. It's, it, the, the law of God is, is pure and, and, and perfect. Nobody is pure and perfect. Well, no. Listen, the law of God is easy. Luke chapter 1, verse 6, for example, um, the, the, the parents of John the Baptist, okay? Now, we, while we're talking about John the Baptist here, the parents of John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth, or as their original Hebrew names, Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, it says that they, this is in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, they walked in all of the commandments of God, all of the law of God, you know, blamelessly, okay? So they obeyed all of the word of God, all of the laws of God. God wouldn't give you laws that you cannot obey. He is not unreasonable. He is not abuse. I mean, any father or any boss, for that matter, that would give their employees or their sons or their children uh, rules that they cannot obey, that's abusive, okay? That is a tyrant. God is not a tyrant. God is not abusive. He is not like that. He gives you laws that you can obey and easily obey. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says that his laws are easy to obey. Okay. You don't have, again, you don't have to climb up to all the way to heaven to get it. You don't have to go all the way down to the depths of the earth to get it. It's right there, right at hand, within reach, easy to obey. Okay. Think about that. Deuteronomy chapter 30, at the very end, after the law of God, the so-called law of God, or the Torah, came down at the very end, at the very end of the Torah, uh, Moshe, Moses made it clear. Actually, God made it clear through Moses. Listen, okay, so now that we're done, now that we're done with giving the, uh, the giving of the law, I want to let you know it's easy. It's easy to obey. It's not hard to obey. Okay. Um, let's go back here. For this is he who was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make the way of the Lord ready, make his path straight. That's in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 to see exactly what it says here, okay? 
Now, let's go back. Okay, keep your finger, if you will, in uh, Matthew chapter 3, because uh, we're going to come right back to here, Matthew chapter 3. But Matthew chapter 3, verse 3 says that the that Isaiah said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make, make the way of the Lord ready, make his path straight. Okay? But if you go over to uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it says something it's not verbatim, and I, I, you need to understand this. Whenever one part of the Bible quotes another part, or whenever, whenever one part of Scripture quotes another part of Scripture, it's not always verbatim, okay? It, they didn't have pocket recorders back then. They didn't have camcorders back then. They didn't have, you know, they weren't so picky as to say, we're gonna, we want to make sure that we, um, that we get this verbatim. They weren't so... St- rigid okay they wanted to capture the spirit of it and this is a lot of what paul was saying in regards to the law in regards to the torah that you need to catch the spirit of the torah not just the torah because if you go by the torah without really catching the spirit of the torah you will misinterpret it okay if you go by the law of god without capturing the spirit of the law of god you know you misinterpret it you you misunderstand it so yes Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, the voice of one who calls out, prepare the way of Yahuwah, or Yahweh, the Lord, in the wilderness. Make a level highway in the desert for our God. Okay? That is what was quoted. Let's go back again to Matthew chapter 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord ready, make his path straight. Okay? Okay? So you need to realize, first of all, realize that when we're reading Matthew, we're reading a translation of the Greek, which was translated from the Hebrew. When we're reading uh, uh, the English uh, translation of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, whatever kind of English translation of the Bible that, you're, that you are uh, reading, uh, you are reading an English translation of Hebrew. So you see how it, it, there, there will be, even if... Matthew quoted it verbatim. There will be loss uh, of there will be loss of accuracy through all the different translations, just the, through translation and such. The voice of one who calls out, "Prepare the way of the Lord or Yahuwah, Yahweh in the wilderness. Make a level highway in the desert for our God." Okay, see how that's different, but it's not different in spirit okay and that's that's the most important thing let's go back to matthew chapter 3 going back to verse 4 now jehokanon himself wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist his food was locusts and wild honey okay uh just stop there for a second locusts in the law of god is not unclean i know a lot of you be like oh like this is a you know an insect uh there are a lot of unclean insects. Actually, most of them are unclean according to the law of God, but locust is not according to the Torah. Uh, and wild honey. Now, I know a lot of you will probably be conjuring up images in your mind of how that looks like. Actually, today, in some cultures, they still do cook up locusts and wild honey. Okay, uh, It's actually a dish that is actually cooked together. It's made together. Um it's actually uh, quite a dish. Uh, I haven't tasted it myself, haven't had it myself, but I've seen pictures of it. Uh, locusts and wild honey or crickets and wild honey. Okay. Verse 5, then, then people from Jerusalem, all of Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, went out to John the Baptist. They were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins But when he saw many of the Parashim, or Pharisees and Sadducees, coming for his baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, Okay, let's stop again right there, okay? Isn't this remarkable that John the Baptist pointed out to some of these people Basically rebuked them for coming out to re, to to be baptized, you know, uh, in the name of repentance or you know for repentance. Isn't this remarkable? 
you offspring of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? In other words, you're not even worthy to hear the message of repentance. You're not even worthy to be baptized. Can you imagine if some of the pastors today actually said that to people walking into the, to the church? You viper, what are you doing here? You're not even worthy to hear this message. Who, fl- who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Go back. You know, go back or, you know, go back to the world, so to speak. Can you imagine if, if pastors said something like that? Now, again, keep in mind, Yeshua, Jesus said that John the Baptist is one of the greatest human beings or if not the greatest human being that has ever been born. Okay. I know some of you say, oh, that's not the love of God. And some of you say, well, this is still in the Old Testament era. Well, remember, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees saying, you don't know the love of God. Okay. At the same time, he said to, to John the Baptist, he said about John the Baptist, you are, or uh, John the Baptist, uh, excuse me, is the most greatest man or one of the gr- most greatest men that has ever lived. Okay. So take it in context. Verse 8, therefore, John still speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, therefore, produce fruit. Worthy of repentance. In other words, prove that you've repented. And a lot of people think that re- re- repentance is just saying sorry or just feeling sorry for your sins or just praying, oh Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. Oh God, oh Father, I'm sorry for my sin. That's not repentance. You can you can say you're sorry. You can cry your eyes out, okay? I mean, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about Esau who was crying in in sorrow but yet did not attain to repentance, So repentance is actual change, is actual fruit produced. I mean, actual change, an actual change of the circumstances, an actual change of of heart, a real change of heart. Not just saying I'm sorry one minute and then going back to the same old sin the next minute. Repentance is actually getting delivered from that sin, delivered from the bondage of that sin. Okay, so repentance is not feeling sorry. Repentance is not asking for someone to forgive you. Repentance is actually really changing and asking for, excuse me, really changing and uh, being delivered from the bondage of sin so that you don't, you don't do that no more. You don't repent. I mean, you don't sin anymore, but repentance is changing. Okay, uh, so keep that in mind. Again, a lot of people don't understand what repentance really is. Uh, John the Baptist again said to these Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees, produce fruit worthy of repentance. Okay? Fruit worthy of repentance again. That is, you've repented? Yeah, prove it. You know? Uh, you're not just coming out here just to put on a show to make it look like you repented. You're not coming out here just to say you're sorry. But you come out here, if you're going to come out here and say you've repented, you better really, really mean it. You've actually better, you have but you've better changed, you know, you have better been changed. Okay. Um, verse nine, don't think to yourselves, John the Baptist still speaking here. Don't think to yourselves. We have Abraham for our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. In other words, don't think you're so good. Don't think you're so good that you are, uh, biological descendants of Abraham or whatever, because really the, God can raise up children of, uh, to Abraham from these stones, okay? So, again, the emphasis is on repentance. John the Baptist continues in verse 10. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Okay? Here, again, is alluding to the fire of hell. I indeed baptize you in water for repentance... But he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. Okay, again, keep in mind that uh, another thing you should realize is that John the Baptist wasn't the first one to actually uh, introduce this whole idea of baptism. And I know a lot of Christians, even pastors, even church leaders, uh, think that John the Baptist was like the first one to actually introduce the, the whole doctrine of baptism. Absolutely not. Where did John get it from? Actually, archaeological evidence proves that there were baptismal tanks or baptismal um, places to be baptized in in the in the land of Israel before the time of Jehochanan. Okay, where did John get this from? Well, he got it from you know the the doctrines that have been passed down and the practices that have been passed down. They were baptizing before John came. Uh, evidence proves that. Um, 
I mean, it, the whole idea was present in the time of Noah, with the uh, the baptism of the of the land, the the earth, so to speak. Okay, where the whole earth was baptized in water and and, and came out anew, afresh. Okay, where the, where the uh, sin, where evil was destroyed in the waters, and afterwards uh, was uh, after the water of baptism was not was nothing but righteous people that were what that were uh, um, uh, there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, baptism was not introduced initially by John, but, but it was in the works for a long time. We got the baptism uh, of the earth by Noah. We got baptiz- baptismal waters, um, you know, alluded to when we, we uh, read about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, going through the Red Sea, you know, into the wilderness and then in, in through the uh, into the promised land, uh, the generation after that. So that whole thing was a picture of baptism, where the children of Israel was, was, you know, by implication, baptized into the Red Sea, and then came out and was in the wilderness for forty years. And after that, their children went into the uh, promised land. Now, look, think about Yeshua, where the children, the children of Israel, are a uh, like a like a parallel to Yeshua, Yeshua. Uh, was baptized in the River Jordan just as the children of Israel was baptized in the Red Sea, spent 40 days in the wilderness just as the children of Israel spent 40 years in the, in the, in the wilderness, and then later on went to the Promised Land. Uh, uh, Jesus went to the Promised Land to, to start his real primary ministry. Uh, whereas the children of Israel went to the pro- promised land uh, after being 40 years in the wilderness uh, to start their primary life in the Promised Land. Okay? So yes, uh, baptism did not start with John the Baptist. Okay, so John said, I indeed baptize in water for repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. Okay, that's humility. That is humility. When, when John said, you know, sa- whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry, meaning that, hey, I am so humbled that... Um, Yeshua is is uh, is coming after me. Uh, he's going to basically replace me, replace my ministry, and uh, he he is so great. I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. Okay, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, the uh, Textus Receptus and New uh, add with and with fire. Okay, so. Uh, baptism by the Holy Spirit and baptism by fire are two completely different things. The baptism by fire does not is not talking about the baptism of uh, of the Holy Spirit as we see in Acts chapter two. The bapt- uh, baptism by fire refers to baptism into death. Okay, when you completely die to self, when you completely are 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 dead to self. The old is completely dead. The old man, so to speak, is completely dead, and the new man, so to speak, is risen with is living, uh, you know, with Christ is alive with Christ. Baptism with fire is talking about that being baptized into the death of Yeshua, where you're able to say, "I am crucified with Christ." That's baptism by fire. Let me just stop for a second here. Every time the scriptures talk about fire, uh, it's, I, I can't say every time, but in, in many times when the scriptures talk about fire, it's talking about death. Okay, it's fire is a symbol of death. Passing people th- or passing something through the fire is actually meaning killing it, basically. Okay, um, so yes, baptism into fire is when you die to self, completely die to self, and you rise again in newness of life, born again, okay? Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He, again, this is he speaking of Jesus, speaking of Yeshua, will gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now this is John the Baptist preaching about Jesus, talking about Jesus will burn the, uh, the, the chaff, which is, you know, the chaff is, uh, 
uh, the weeds, so to speak, the, the goats, so to speak, the people who are not his people. Jesus will burn them with fire. That's what he is saying. Now, we, we haven't come to that day yet where, where Yeshua comes back and, and, and really burns them with fire. Uh, although a lot of them have died and are burning spiritually in uh, um, in hell. Uh, we'll get to that later on in, in the scriptures. But yes, it's very important that uh, to, to realize that uh, John the Baptist, when preaching about Yeshua, talks about Yeshua's um, mission to burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan, the Jordan, okay, or the Jordan River, to Yohanan to be baptized by him. But Yohanan would have hindered him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? But Yeshua answered and said to him, Allow it now, for this is the fitting way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, so... Yeshua had to fulfill righteousness, okay? Again, look at this. When Yeshua, when Jesus was baptized by John, he was saying he was fulfilling that duty to be baptized, okay? Now, again, a lot of Christians think that when Jesus said, I come to fulfill the law, that means that it was basically that Jesus kind of almost like done away with it, so to speak. Not at all, okay? Remember, Jesus was a Jew, Rabbi, okay, Jewish, 100% Jewish. Now you go and you ask some some uh, practicing Jews today, Orthodox Jewish rabbis today, have you fulfilled the mitzvah? Have you fulfilled the commands? They'll say, yes, I have. To fulfill in the Jewish mindset, you got to, again, you got to realize when you're reading the scriptures, you got to read it from the Jewish mindset, the, the real Hebraic way of looking at things. To fulfill a law or a commandment or a mitzvah is to obey it, to actually do it. When Jesus said, I don't come to destroy the law, I don't come to destroy the Torah, but fulfill it, he was saying, I come to obey it. Actually, according to one of Christianity's most trusted sources, the um, uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon, it says that that word fulfill actually means to cause God's law, the Torah, to be obeyed as it should be. Okay? So, Yehokanon, you know, uh, he allowed him. Of course, he, he said, okay, you know, if this is what you have to do to fulfill righteousness, this is what we have to do. And Jesus was, when Jesus, when he was baptized, went up directly from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming on him. Verse 17, behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Okay. So that concludes the, uh, the reading of Matthew chapter 3. However, just as a side note before I close this entire uh, video here, this whole thing about Jesus being baptized and a voice coming out of the heavens saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Peter mentioned that he heard this, uh, actually not speaking about the baptism per se, but, uh, but you know, the whole idea of the whole, uh, actually referring to the whole experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, where again, the father uh, affirmed and confirmed his relationship with the son by saying, behold, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And Peter said, listen, when I, when we come to you, proclaiming to you the good news about Yeshua. We don't come to you uh, uh, declaring to you any kind of fables or stories, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. We have heard it when the voice came out of, of heaven saying, this is my beloved son um, in, in whom I'm well pleased. Again, he wasn't referring to this particular instance of it, but he was referring to um, the instance where he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord. Okay, so that concludes uh, the reading of Matthew chapter 3. In the next video is uh, the reading of Matthew chapter 4. So don't forget to, uh, to get that and uh, don't miss out on that teaching. Um, thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and check, and check out uh, other uh, social media platforms as well and, and, uh, and also my blog. Thank you very much and God bless you. God enlighten you and give you knowledge beyond all of your peers in the listening and reading and studying of his word. Thanks again. Bye.